and our speaker this time is Roger Melko. He received his PhD from the University of California at Santa Barbara and spent two years as a Wigner Fellow at the Oak Ridge National Lab afterwards. Today, he is a professor of physics at the University of Waterloo in Canada and a faculty member at the Perimeter Institute. His research circles around a number of fundamental questions in condensed matter physics and the physics of many body systems. In his work, he uses simulations to characterize phase transitions, find new exotic states of matter, and elucidate the role of quantum effects. And today, he will pick out one aspect from this very diverse set of topics and methods, and will talk about machine learning in the context of quantum state tomography. Roger, please take it away. Okay, thank you, Philip. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen now. <laughs> Someone give me a thumbs up if this works. All right. Yeah, thanks again, Philip and uh, Peter for the introduction. Of course, I wish I could be there in person. I miss, I miss tea time at uh, All Souls College. So maybe, maybe next time. Um, as, uh, as Philip mentioned, I'm a condensed matter theorist. Um, uh, however, we do a lot of work with uh, sort of uh, this, I'd say new generation of quantum information uh, experimentalists uh, who are building sort of um, these near, you know, noisy intermediate scale or near term quantum devices. So what I'm going to talk today about is sort of how we use machine learning, uh, specifically unsupervised learning with generative models uh, to look at and to reconstruct the quantum states that are prepared by these experimentalists. So, uh, so as mentioned, I'm a professor at University of Waterloo and I'm at the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics. This picture here is the group of people not last summer, the summer before the pandemic, uh, who were working on machine learning sort of in quantum information and quantum uh, uh, condensed matter. And I've just been adding photos to this as the pandemic rages on. So uh, you can kind of get a rough idea for the size of the effort uh, that's, that's um, uh, at the Perimeter Institute. So as mentioned, I, uh, I work on um, condensed matter, but I, I'm kind of, gen I'm going to generalize that for this audience to just, uh, use the, the kind of lingo quantum many body physics. And there's many tasks and there's many interesting open problems and all sorts of interesting research that uh, of course people um, uh, perform in quantum many body research. But I wanna talk about uh, sort of one aspect where we, we, we basically construct models of our, you know, our universe, the, the part of the universe that we're interested in. And then we try to solve those models to I guess glean information about, uh, you know, you know, maybe microscopic ingredients that lead to certain, certain macroscopic phenomena. And that's kind of the, I'd say that's kind of in some sense, the theme of condensed matter is like, what are, what are the microscopic, uh, you know, ingredients that go into something like high temperature superconductivity or, or, you know, topological phases or something like that. So I've used the word models and, and we can, we construct models often um, sort of in collaboration with other theorists and experimentalists and so on. And those models typically take the form of, some sort of interacting Hamiltonian, uh, where a lot of where we, you know we believe uh, we've we've kind of distilled uh, some ingredients of a macroscopic system perhaps down into these microscopic ingredients. So I've kind of shown two Hamiltonians, which are um, you know typical for condensed matter uh, uh, physicists. One uh, the you know Hubbard model, uh, which is studied uh, by whole swaths of um, uh, you know, subfields in condensed matter uh, who are looking to kind of explain, quote unquote, the mechanism underlying high temperature superconductivity. And sort of implicit in that is the, I guess, you know, the belief that if we understand the ingredients, yeah, you know, like the microscopic quantum ingredients that go into, uh, you know, current high temperature superconductivity, we may be able to help in the design of future, you know, maybe perhaps room temperature superconductors or other, you know, materials and matter. Um, devices and things like that. So kind of implicit in the, the, is this idea of, you know, discovering something about, uh, a, you know, a, 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 a macroscopic phenomena and then perhaps uh, helping to design or predict what's uh, occurring in an experiment. So I'd say it's a very experimentally driven field in that sense. Um, so in these, you know, when we, when we talk about building a model and, and, you know, you know, constructing a Hamiltonian that may sit on a lattice. And of course it has different ingredients like, you know, kinetic energy hopping, 
uh, interactions, you know, topology, all these sorts of things that we bake into the model. Then the question is, how do you solve that model and what does it mean to solve it? And solving it typically, uh, you know, if we're thinking about low energy, low temperature physics, you know, number one involves understanding the ground state, the properties of the ground state. It's really the vacuum with which in, you know, things emerge. And, and of course, you know, things like correlation functions within that vacuum state, the elementary excitation, so the low-lying uh, spectrum and the, you know, the fundamental particles of the condensed matter system, if you will, that emerged from that vacuum. And then all sorts of non-trivial things like topological defects um, or topological invariants and things like that. And this is a hard problem. And it's hard in a very precise sort of computational complexity sense, which I probably won't really get into too much. Um, but it's, it's, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's, sorry, I'm just fooling around my screen. It's, it's hard. Uh, you know, many of these tasks are difficult, uh, you know, very, uh, fundamentally in, in the, in the sense that we would like to solve this Hamiltonian or perhaps simulate it. Maybe we want to solve it by hand and we can understand why that's hard, but we may also want to simulate it. And that could be a very difficult problem, even an exponentially hard problem. So, you know, I'm kind of alluding to fermionic systems, maybe frustrated magnetic systems, which live on lattices. And I'll show some examples of what we're interested in. Uh, but, you know, really we're, we're stuck sometimes. Some of these Hamiltonians are just difficult and, and even exponentially difficult to solve or simulate. So just a, a note, you know, where does that difficulty come from? And I mean, you can imagine taking a quantum system and diagonalizing the Hamiltonian, right? To kind of get the uh, spectrum. I mean, that, that's obviously, or maybe not obviously, but it's clearly an exponential, uh, exponentially difficult problem. Um, there's, you know, there's other, there's of course many approximations that one may make if you're trying to uh, construct a numerical solution. And, and hardness or even exponential hardness can creep in to all sorts of different parts of this problem. So for example, if I just wanted to, you know, even store a representation of the wave function, uh, psi, uh, you, you can easily convince yourself that, and, and I think people who work on quantum antibody systems see this immediately, uh, that, you know, the number of parameters required to represent that wave function, uh, you know, naively is something that's exponentially growing. You know, so if you had a qubit system or any system that has two, you know, degrees of freedom, uh, this, this number, there'd be two, two to the n of these coefficients, let me put it that way. So, of course, there's all sorts of approximations, you know, non-interacting uh, particles as an approximation and so on that go into, uh, you know, uh, trying to reduce this complexity. But in some cases in condensed matter, especially where interactions matter, like in that Hubbard model or a frustrated magnetism, uh, you know, it's not as obvious how uh, some of these difficulty or uh, some of these hardnesses get boiled down to something simple. Um, you know, another good example is, you know, you, you may have a sort of efficient representation of a quantum system if you're lucky. Uh, but you may have difficulty in finding the optimal parameters, uh, you know, or optimizing over the space of parameters. And so you can have, and, and this is, this I think is very familiar to people who work on machine learning. I mean, you have some loss landscape and the question is, you know, are the barren plateaus, you know, are we getting stuck in local minima? Are we finding the true global minima? And, and that, you know, that brings us into uh, a whole nother field of physics uh, that relates to glassiness in these landscapes and, and, and sort of ergodicity problems. Ergodicity problems are very familiar to people like me who work on Monte Carlo methods, uh, where you know we're sampling a configuration space, so it's not necessarily a loss landscape that you're trying to optimize, but it's a configuration space, and the time required to get representative representative samples uh, could be exponentially large. And that's typically another way of saying we lose ergodicity. And even if we can produce samples, uh, there are cases where producing expectation values of observables can be exponentially difficult, even in a quantum sense. So there's lots of different ways for things to be hard. <laughs> Let me put it that way. And just checking if my slides progressing, it should be on quantum simulators now. Yes, yes, it works. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So this, this sort of experimental field of quantum simulators or quantum emulators, in some sense is meant to uh, I would say uh, get rid of one of the difficulties of, of this many body problem. And it's really saying, you know, this is all the way back to Feynman who talked about quantum computers in 1982 or three or whatever it was, uh, you know, when he suggested that, you know, if we really want to solve a quantum system, whatever that means, or simulate a quantum system, we really should have a quantum computer. 
and, and, you know, it bypasses many of these exponential difficulties. Like for example, you don't need a classical representation of a wave function if you prepare it experimentally. I mean, that's just one simple way of imagining it. So quantum simulation is, is this field of, uh, uh, you know, physics that comes from AMO and Kenan's matter and other, uh, you know, kind of disparate fields where, you know, it's, you know, Hamiltonians, let me put it that way, or interactions um, uh, may be implemented experimentally, typically in highly controlled devices like cold atoms, trapped ions, you know, maybe superconducting circuits, um, things like that, where the, you know, the individual kind of qubit control uh, and coupling turns into uh, an emulation of a Hamiltonian of interest. And just kind of a simple picture that I've ripped off the internet somewhere. I mean, you can just imagine that, um, you know, in that Hubbard model where you have, you know, hopping or tunneling and interactions, you know, you can emulate that uh, with actual real atoms, which are trapped in the standing wave, uh, you know, pattern of some optical lattice, let's just say, uh, which can be tuned. And so you can have actually, you know, tune, you know tuning of, of laser uh, intensities and frequencies in these optical lattices uh, can really give you interactions which emulate almost directly that which could occur, for example, in that solid state, you know, or condensed matter Hubbard, Hubbard model type Hamiltonian. And the problem becomes a, kind of an experimental theory uh, collaboration in a way because, um, you know, you, you need to understand these simulators. You need to be able to extract data from these simulators. So I, I'm imagining measuring the state uh, and really, uh, you know, helping uh, to verify and characterize what's going on. And, that, it, you know, it becomes a, it's just a different problem. And that problem is very much a data-driven problem. So we, in some sense, we've gotten rid of the uh, task of solving the Hamiltonian or diagonalizing the Hamiltonian or whatever you want, want to call it, uh, because that thing is now implemented directly in the experiment. But now the task turns into, you know, how do we extract information from that experiment? Uh, how do we uh, perhaps control that experiment? You know, how do we give feedback into the control? Uh, how do we characterize? How do we verify? Uh, and how do we learn from it? And so this data-driven problem, I'm arguing, you know, this is kind of the thesis of my talk, that, you know, this is something that's very suitable for sort of modern machine learning methods. And so I believe really the kind of era that we're um, embarking upon is, is really this, uh, you know, uh, feedback loop, if you will, or this collaboration uh, between experimental uh, devices, which produce a large amount of data, and sort of our state-of-the-art technology, which can classify, process, uh, and, and so on, uh, that data. So to kind of get us into the, uh, you know, into the machine learning side of things, I'm going to discuss basically kind of the philosophy or the strategy behind learning a state, you know, from that simulator based on the data that it produces. And so this is, should be something that's familiar uh, to us in an unsupervised learning context. And so let me just forget the quantum nature and I'll, I'll forget the quantum nature for most of this talk. And, and I'll just imagine that I'm, I'm looking at classical data. Okay. And what is classical data? So, you know, classical data is something that's, you know, coming from uh, a black box, which is my experiment. And it's really, you know, just a set of, uh, you know, let's call it numbers, but I'm really just going to look at binary, uh, binary vectors. And so this is a single data vector that if I had n qubits in my experiment would be of length n, okay? And, uh, you know, I assume that I have access in this experiment uh, to data uh, that, uh, you know, roughly is of what we imagine uh, training neural networks on and machine learning tasks. I like the, I like the number 10,000. It's usually something like 1,000 to 10,000. Um, there's some budget for producing data. You know, data is expensive in these simulators. And so there's, you know, there's, there's some limit to how much data you can produce. But in the classical setting, let me just imagine that that data is drawn from a probability distribution. And I'll get to the kind of nuances, the difference between, uh, you know, a classical distribution and a quantum wave function later in the talk. But really, just let me imagine that inside this experimental black box is a probability distribution that we're interested in learning about, okay? And the only access we have is through this data. These could be projective qubit measurements for the quantum physicists. And so we want to use only that data to find uh, the optimal parameters of some, uh, you know, uh, some representation. And I'm going to abuse the word model. 
So now I'm switching gears when I say model and I'm talking about actually a model like we would imagine um, in machine learning, like a generative model. And let me just say that, you know, as a note, why don't we just build the frequency representation or approximation of that distribution uh, through the data? I mean, I think the underlying uh, point is that, you know, we don't have access to enough data to necessarily give a good representation of that, um, uh, of the likelihood of every single uh, element of that distribution. So there's some data missing. And we, we you know, that, that would affect our generalization. If we produce data that wasn't in the training set, to use that lingo, uh, you know, we wouldn't generalize well if we use uh, this frequency uh, distribution. So that's, that's kind of, I think, well known in, in maybe in machine learning or generative modeling circles. So the idea is that we, instead, we parameterize a model. So model, which I'll talk about, you know, has some, you know, imagine some neural network with some parameters that I'm calling lambda here. That model, in some sense, smooths out, uh, you know, the missing or interpolates uh, the missing information that this smallest, smallish data set uh, doesn't give us access to. And, and you can imagine if you have a Gaussian and there's you know, a mean and a standard deviation, that could be your two parameters, right? It's much easier to maybe fit those two parameters, uh, which would be a model from a limited data set than to reconstruct the entire Gaussian from the frequency distribution. So our goal is really to make this model through parameter adjustment as close as possible to what's in that black box. Uh, with access only to the data. And so we're gonna use generative models, and that's what I'm gonna talk about in this talk. And generative models are, I mean, I'll, I'll classify them in a minute, but really they're, um, in some sense, you know, models uh, that we build of these underlying probability distributions given a data set that we can also sample from. Okay, so that's the generative step. And I'm gonna talk about our restricted Bolson machines, which are like a stochastic neural network with binary variables, I'll, I'll, I'll introduce what, the, what I mean later. I'll talk about recurrent neural networks, um, which are autoregressive models that are very powerful. Um, but just as a note, you know, I should have put a citation here. There's many different possible generative models that can be substituted for what I'm talking about in this talk. And so a particular um, type of uh, uh, model, autoregressive model that's being pursued uh, by Juan Kiriski and others at Vector is really uh, is these transformers. So if you know GPT-3, you know, the underlying transformer technology there, it could also be used for, the, you know, this attention-based mechanism could also be used for what I'm talking about. But just a step back. So generative models, um, again, they have some parameters. They're, you know, you train them from data. Uh, once they're trained, or even during training, but once they're trained, we're really interested in the new data that they can produce. Um, or you know, perhaps the likelihoods for new measurements that are coming in from the device. Uh, but I'll focus on the first kind of strategy where we have them produce new data samples and then we use these data samples to calculate estimators. And I'll talk about that. So there's different types of generative models. And I find this classification by Ian Goodfellow uh, fairly useful. So this is from his, his GAN paper back in NeurIPS uh, in 2017. And, uh, you know, really he classifies generative models, uh, you know, so they're, uh, in some sense, he's looking at a maximum likelihood branch and I'll explain what that means. But I think really everything we're talking about today is, is sort of under this maximum likelihood branch. Um, and then he, he breaks up uh, generative models into explicit and implicit density, okay? So explicit density, I, I think of as, you know, really the parameters in the model, um, you know, explicitly represent the probability distribution. Whereas an implicit density, you don't have that representation. You know, it's implicit. The GAN is something, you know, and the GAN right here falls under this implicit density uh, uh, sort of branch because, you know, really what you're doing with the GAN is, you know, you have this generator and discriminator and you're kind of making them fight. But you don't, you know, explicitly parameterize a probability distribution inside of that, for example. So I'm going to stick on the explicit density branch here and talk about you know, both the tractable and the approximate density cases, okay? And these are, there's an important difference between tractable and approximate densities uh, when, we, uh, when we reconstruct um, either the probability distributions or the wave functions that underlie these uh, simulator experiments. Um, and so you kind of, I'm, I'm gonna maybe introduce these from a historical perspective. Um, and the first one will be along this branch, so explicit density, approximate density, 
and then Markov chain. And that's the restricted Boltzmann machine. So the restricted Boltzmann machine uh, is really a generative model um, that you know has a, has a number of parameters. It has um, it has a you know you can vary the expressive expressiveness of the representational power through a latent space. Okay, to use that language, um, and it's actually a relatively powerful uh, piece of technology. Interestingly, so John Hopfield, uh, who's I would call him a condensed matter theorist. Uh, he was he was Bert Halperin's advisor. I think Steve Berman's advisor. Uh, he he kind of started a lot of this field with uh, what, what we now call Hopfield networks, which to the condensed matter or statistical physicists uh, is is really just uh, um, an Ising model. Okay, so what restricted Boltzmann machine is sort of the modern uh, uh, a variation of a Hopfield network. Um, and, and I've illustrated it here. So it's an Ising model and there's Ising degrees of freedom. That's what these circles are. And we've split them into two layers, one which is a visible layer and one which is a hidden layer. That visible layer is the, the, you know, the number of binary variables, the Ising variables, we actually use zero and, zeros and ones, is the same as the number of qubits in the device or you know, the length of the data vector, right? So there's, I'm calling it N. And uh, you know, really what, a general, what this generative model does is you can imagine it taking in uh, these binary numbers um, into the input layer. Uh, and then learning some representation. The hidden layer uh, is just a number of binary units. Again, it's an Ising, Ising variables, and you can vary the size of it to give you different representational power or to give you different um, you know, uh, expressiveness of the, of the neural network. So the, rep the probability distribution is represented uh, explicitly through a Boltzmann-like or Gibbs-like distribution uh, where, where you have a partition function uh, and it's, you know, they call them energy based because, uh, you know, you construct this energy and this is the Ising Hamiltonian where you have, uh, you know, weights, which are the Ising interactions and they only exist between invisible and hidden layers. And that's the restricted nature of an RBM. And then you have biases or fields. And so the point is you have an explicit representation of the probability distribution, uh, but you do not know the partition function or the normalization here. Okay. And that's important. So you don't, you can't get a tractable density out of this. You can't get a tractable uh, likelihood um, because you would need to know that partition function. Um, so I'm using Lambda as the parameters and I'm, you know, I'm not gonna talk a lot about the details of these RBMs, um, but just know that in order to actually represent uh, the physical distribution in order to obtain an approximation, uh, you have to marginalize out these hidden units. So there's this additional step in RBMs uh, where you have to trace over all the hiddens. And then really what that does is give you this marginal distribution, which is the goal. Again, this is the goal is that you train all of these parameters, these weights and biases to obtain P lambda of X. I'll show results on that. Any questions on the RBM? I'm gonna talk about one more generative model. RBMs used to be used for generative pre-training of deep neural networks before AlexNet came out, You know, before the convolutional neural networks um, basically became performing better. So they're not used that much in industry anymore. So I'm going to go to this left side here, tractable density. Okay. So a what's a tractable density model? So you're familiar, if, if you're familiar with natural language processing, any sort of, uh, you know, sequence to sequence mapping, like English to French translation or, uh, or text completion, like GPT-3 or talk to transformer. If you're bored right now, just Google talk to transformer and start typing in there. Um, th that's on the tractable density side of this. Uh, so, okay, yeah, nades, uh, um, pixel RNNs, and, and transformers I would put here. So I'm gonna talk about um, the uh, recurrent neural network on this side. And so we've actually adopted um, uh, most of what I'm gonna talk about uh, in terms of generative modeling, we've started to adopt these RNNs. And there's, there's several reasons. I mean, first of all, first of all, they're, they're a normalized distribution. So, um, I mean, just to go back there, explicit density, but they're also normalized, so they're tractable. And that's one of the big points. So just because it's a machine learning talk, let me quickly go over how an RNN works here. And what we use an RNN for is we take that data, and I call my visible data vectors, or my input data vectors X, uh, and, you know, 
each X or each, uh, you know, let's say each binary number. So each qubit projective measurement or each one and zero uh, is fed into an RNN uh, cell. Uh, and that cell is then, you know, unrolled, if you will, um, to, the, to correspond to the length of that vector. So what is an RNN? It's, it's these data vectors. And so there's some initial value that's fed into an RNN cell, which is just some default set to zero. There's a hidden vector, which is passed between um, each one of these cells. Or rather, remember, this is recurrent. So what really happens with a hidden uh, vector is it, it wraps back around and feeds into itself. The output, if, you know, if I'm starting with uh, H0, uh, is H, uh, H1, which is given by this formula here. Okay, so it's just some activation function. This is like a simple, what do they call it? Like plain vanilla RNN, where you have a weight matrix, uh, you, know, you have another matrix here, and then you have some biases. So, I mean, the parameters of an RNN are buried inside of these expressions. It's, it's you know, a little, it looks a little more complicated than the RBM, uh, but you, know, you don't have to worry about too much of the details. Weights, so W, U, um, B, V, and C are like the parameters that you're gonna train inside of one of these RNNs. So that's what happens when you feed in input data. Uh, the output is, a, a, you know, again, it's input. Output is a hidden, this next, I guess, if you will, iteration or step of the hidden vector. It uh, gets processed uh, by a softmax function in our case um, and to output what we call Y. And Y is conditional probabilities. So we interpret Y as the probability of the next qubit in the chain, if you will, or the next projective measurement or the next binary vector being either you know zero or one conditioned on uh, all of the previous um, uh, all of the previous uh, elements of that vector so we actually select probabilistically uh, you know the next element of the of the of the input vector and that's input into the next iteration so that's how it's a generative model okay so if I go back to the let me just go back to the RNN how is this a generative model? Because you train it and then you can sample visibles and you can sample hidden units. And so you can produce new um, binary vectors uh, of the visible layer. Like if you look at the marginal distribution, you can just sample that and you can do it, but you don't know the problem. You don't know the partition function. Let me put it that way. In the RNN, you, this is also how you produce samples of the input vector. This is how you produce new samples of, of the projective qubit measurements or whatever you're calling it but it looks very different. And the, one of the points is that when you interpret the output of, of each cell uh, probabilistically as a, as a conditional probability, you can um, uh, form the product of all of these conditionals. So I've written you know, X uh, less whatever I here is like written explicitly out in this expression. Uh, this is the autoregressive nature of a recurrent neural network, okay? and by the chain rule, I think it's called, if you take the product of all these things together, you get the full, you know, oops, the full normalized distribution, uh, which is what you're looking for at the end. So that is what's special about autoregressive models is you get a, you, you know, essentially in some sense, you don't, you, you know, the, you, it's not like you have an unknown partition function. Uh, you know the normalized distribution. You can produce perfect uncorrelated samples with no autocorrelation between them. And something I won't talk about, which, but which is also implicit in this structure, is that you can implement symmetries directly into an R RNN. And if you look back at an RN, RBM, it's very difficult to imagine implementing symmetries in here um, if you don't basically mess with, the, mess with the structure of it. So, I mean, let me know if you have any questions. Um, this is, uh, I'm going to show how these work now okay but, but this is kind of the underlying technology that we are using um and you know I've, I've simplified this one a lot but you know you have lstms you have gru's you have all sorts of things that occur uh inside these rnn cells so just feel free to interrupt me uh if you have questions just, so just a step back now if you forget the specific architecture what is training of a generative model again we take in we take data vectors that are coming from that black box and we want to somehow adjust the parameters of the um, uh, model, these lambdas, so that whatever it is that that distribution, you know, that explicit representation of that distribution is, uh, it matches as closely as possible to the P of X, which is in the black box. Okay, that's, so that's the red. So we want the blue curves and the red curves to lie perfectly on top of each other. 
And one way of doing that is, is defining an optimization problem, uh, you know, where we want to optimize those parameters based on some cost function. And the KL divergence is a popular one. It's, it's like a cross, it's like a relative entropy or whatever. Um, you know, it's like if you traced out X, P log, um, P over P lambda. And because the parameters, which is what you want to, uh, you know, optimize uh, over are only exist in the denominator of this expression, right? You can throw away that P log P, which is the entropy of the data set. And, and that turns into what you would call a log likelihood. So, you know, if you flip it on its head and say, get rid of that minus sign, then the problem of training a generative model turns into the problem of maximizing the log likelihood. And so on the top of, of uh, Ian Goodfellow's tree is, is, you know, maximum likelihoods. And this is where it comes from in all of these cases. So this is the object here that you, you know, log P lambda, uh, you know, you can turn it into a problem where you've sampled X from this, uh, this um, probability distribution P, right? And so since, and that's the black box. So since you have X distributed according to these samples, then the expectation value of log P lambda is really the cost function and that that's what defines the loss landscape so that's a very simple way of seeing it and then what do you do you just do what everyone else does and do gradient descent on that that loss landscape so really just that definition is is sort of what goes into it once it's trained again you can generate new instances of data vectors so new projective measurements from qubits or whatever you want to call it okay and and so you can produce new data vectors and you get Presumably it's efficient to sample. In some cases, you can get many more. Um, what I'm gonna do is calculate physical estimators from those, uh, those generative generated samples. And, and hopefully, you know, again, uh, we have a limited amount of training data, but we have, um, um, you know, we have unlimited, we can produce unlimited generative data afterwards. And so that hopefully that generalizes well. And I'll look at these two estimators. And again, one important point in the generative step is that RBMs, because they're non-normalized, um, you have to sample them with a Markov chain procedure. And that Markov chain gives you an autocorrelation function. So this is the correlation between two elements in that chain, like two adjacent elements in the Markov chain, right? And so there's some autocorrelation time uh, sort of implicit in that, which reduces the efficiency. RNNs and transformers and other autoregressive models don't have this. They produce perfectly independent samples. And so, you know, this autocorrelation has all sorts of consequences for ergodicity and mode collapse and so on uh, that aren't in RNNs. So that's just another reason that we use these autoregressive models. Okay, so let me know if there's any questions on the uh, generative modeling aspect. So now let's turn to what we do with these things and I'll, I'll, um, I'll, I'll kind of maybe go through this a bit quicker. So now we have a way of representing a probability distribution. What does that have to do with quantum systems, right? I keep saying things like projective measurements. Well, this procedure can be essentially generalized to learn a wave function. And you can see that most simply if I have what I'm calling a classical wave function, which is probably bad terminology, but a, a wave function that has no uh, complex or negative amplitudes. Let me put it that way. So it's really just square root of a probability distribution. Uh, in that case, uh, you know, the probability distribution that you're learning by this procedure that I told you about is exactly what you need for, you know, to represent the wave function. And, and that's it. One set of data, one basis, that's all you need. If you have a phase in your wave function, then, you, then what I'm saying, it, it, you know, has to be generalized. You have to be able to learn that phase. And so the biggest problem is that you need measurements and other bases in order to populate that phase. Um, and, and you also need to be able to represent that uh, phase somehow in the structure of the generative model. And there's different ways of doing it. You could have complex weights, um, but you know, I won't talk too much about that. And then for the aficionados out there, of course, you're dealing with mixed states often experimentally. And so you really have to think about how you um, structure this as a density matrix. So I'm gonna focus on a class of wave functions, which is true to the left-hand side here. Okay, so it's, it's, it's wave functions that in some basis, which I'll call the computational basis, the coefficients are all real and positive. And actually that's a fairly large class of, mo of models by the first sense of the word or Hamiltonians that we call stochastic. And what, what stochastic means is that 
all off diagonal matrix elements of the Hamiltonian are negative. And if that's true, then by the parent Frobenius theorem, uh, the extramal eigenvalues are all real and positive. And so the ground state wave function has this structure here or this structure here. Okay, so that's just a class of, of, of quantum Hamiltonians, let me put it that way. But it's an important class and it's very relevant for a certain type of simulator that's coming out experimentally. Uh, and so the, the experiment, the data that I'm going to show comes from a Rydberg uh, atom, uh, like a, a, a many body Rydberg atom simulator. Uh, and, and the Hamiltonian that's emulated by the device uh, is this Hamiltonian here is first first studied uh, theoretically by your colleague, Paul Findlay, uh, who I hope is on this call. And it was studied experimentally, or at least in the AMO setting, let me put it that way, um, by Serac and Zoller and others. Um, uh, and, that, and that really has to do with this, these long range interactions. So this is a very interesting Hamiltonian. Uh, uh, it, it talks about the interactions between uh, Rydberg atoms, which are atoms in highly excited states. Okay, and these can be loaded into optical lattices and so on. And there's some transition amplitude related to the Rabi frequency of going between the ground state where the atom is literally in its ground state to this highly excited Rydberg state. And what's interesting about Hamiltonians of this type um, as pointed out by Paul and others is that there's a blockade mechanism uh, which occurs between uh, highly excited states. So here's an illustration. Um, but if I have this interaction potential between two Rydberg states, uh, it could preclude uh, two highly excited states being within a certain radius of each other. And, and, and in, the, you know, in the experiment, there's really some kind of decay of this uh, interaction, one over R to the six. And so really what it means is that if two atoms are too close to each other, they can't both be excited into the Rydberg state. And that interaction mechanism gives all sorts of interesting um, lattice dependent, um, you know, or geometric dependent uh, phenomena. And if you don't believe me, there's two papers, this may be for the, more for the condensed matter theorists. There's two papers that came out last week, one by Satchdev's group and one by Oshman Vishnov's group, who on different lattices, I'll just go through this real quick, the Kagame and the, uh, what's this one called? The Ruby lattice. Uh, they claim to see Z2 spin liquids. Okay, so maybe this is for the experts, but Z2 spin liquids are exotic quantum phases that have no conventional order parameter. And their low-lying excitations are topological in nature and can be used as, you know, um, they can be used for uh, things like topologically protected qubits. Uh, so it's, it's very interesting from both a condensed matter and a quantum information perspective to try to find phases, if you will, phases of matter that could be used for topologically protected quantum computing. And these two papers, again, which came out at, at basically at the same time, they claim they didn't know about each other, which is fun but also Misha Lukens on both papers. So that gave me a chuckle. But anyway, they claim that there's a pretty robust part of the phase diagram in each one of these two lattices with that Rydberg Hamiltonian that has this phase of interest. And again, for the condensed matter people, uh, one of the signatures of a Z2 spin liquid uh, is the topological entanglement entropy, which is a subleading correction to the area law, uh, which gives you a firm signature of Z2 spin liquidity. And so you can see they have some DMRG uh, simulations. But okay, so that's just, there's interesting physics. Here's the experiment. This is where we get the data from. And this is from a paper from 20, when I first noticed this was 2017. And this is, I think a 51 or a 53 atom simulation. So 53 qubits, if you want to call them that. And the black dots are projective measurements in the ground state and the absence of a black, which is like a fluorescing thing. Uh, case is 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 the Rydberg state, and so here's here's actually what our data looks like. This is a data vector: x1, x2, x3, x4. Uh, again, this is coming from stabilizing Rydberg atoms in an optical lattice. Really, technically, what happens is um, the the atoms are prepared in the ground state, and then they adiabatically evolve, which is equivalent to evolving the detuning parameter. And the detuning parameter in the Hamiltonian is this piece here. This is typically almost fixed that Rabi frequency. And, and you, can, you can traverse cuts in the phase diagram. Here's a one-dimensional phase diagram where you have different ordered states. And that Z2 ordered state, not to be confused with the Z2 spin liquid, sorry, uh, is really just an a anti-ferromagnet. And here's the density. Here's, here's something like 13 ions, or sorry, 13 atoms, time evolving into that Z2 ordered state. And you see you know, light, dark, light, dark, light, dark. 
and that's 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 the data. So what we did is we worked with Manuel Andres and Misha Lucan. Um, Manuel built a lot of this experiment before he went to Caltech, and we produced data for the generative models. So in the generative modeling context, um, we and we did it by taking advantage of this adiabatic evolution. Uh, so Really, here are the Rabi and the detuning parameters, but, but you know the Hamiltonian's changing as a function of time as it adiabatically evolves. And you can stop the experiment and take a, a number of projective measurements uh, at each one of these dots. And so you can see um, the detuning changing. So it's cutting through that phase diagram between what they call disordered, but that's everything in the ground state and the Z2 ordered or the anti-ferromagnetic state. And each one of these dots gives us you know, the experiment can really produce about 3000 measurements. And so that number of measurements is, you know, roughly commensurate with what we believe can be used to train, you know, kind of these standard machine learning methods. And so it's everything kind of checks out. We make some assumptions on the wave function. We assume that it's pure, um, that there's, you know, we're not looking at a density matrix. We assume that we have no phase in the wave function. Uh, so there's a lot of assumptions that go in this. And then we take this data at each one of these stopping points, uh, each one of these dots, and we train a different, you know, we train a generative model, uh, but it has different parameters for each one of these, these stopping points. Let me put it that way. And after training, the sample and model can produce all sorts of estimators. And, and so here's, the, here's, here's why we do this. First off, if you have any observable or any, S, you know, yeah, any observable quantity that's diagonal, in the, you know, in the Hamiltonian, it's, it's just really what you're doing is you're looking at the original data in some sense. Okay. So if I have some operator called it a here and I want to measure and that, you know, okay, here's an operator, which is in a spin language. Um, one minus two to the, this is the number of Rydberg atoms. I don't know wh why I did this. Anyway, if that's your operator, that's diagonal. You're really just counting the numbers of light and dark and you're maybe taking an average Right. And, uh, you know, hopefully you're drawing data from a, a probability distribution that's fairly accurate in your model uh, and so on. So here is the result of uh, the experimental uh, measurement of, of sort of the number or the average number of, of uh, ground state uh, spins, if you will, of ground state atoms. And that's the black line. ED is exact diagonalization. So what that is, is that is actually a diagonalization of this Hamiltonian, which can be done in this case because we stuck with nine, eight or nine atoms for this data. Um, so you can actually do the exponentially difficult task of solving for the ground state. And the RBM, which is the generative model we used in this case, was taking the experimental data, training the restricted Boltzmann machine, so training the generative model, and then producing new samples of data from that model and calculating the same expectation value of this operator as, as I've plotted here. So why would you do that is kind of the question. But anyway, it tells us that our generative model is training well. You know, so we, take, we have enough data, uh, we're training that model, we're producing, we're generating new data, and that's these triangles and everything checks out. Why do you do that? So the question we do it, the answer to why we do it is because certain observables aren't immediately accessible from the experimental measurements. And in, in the quantum case, you know, it's really off diagonal, uh, if you will, operators. So here's sigma X, which was defined in, in you know, it's, it's the operator defined. Um, it's like uh, the raising or lowering operator. Let me put it that way. It's raising plus lowering into the Rydberg state. And so, you know, that is not, uh, you know, that is not the basis that we perform the measurements in, right? So you don't have immediate access in the experiment to that sigma X. However, if you have a generative model, which represents the wave function, then, you know, we know how to produce the expectation value of that off angle operator uh, with knowledge of that wave function. So I just have sigma X, sigma X prime here. And that can be turned into something that is numerically um, efficient to calculate, uh, assuming that the thing we call this local estimator here uh, is sparse. And, and that's the case for us. So this, you know, the, the off angle expectation value, um, which is important, uh, you know, to characterize the experiment can be calculated directly from the generative model. And so here I have, again, exact diagonalization is the target. And here is the reconstructed Sigma X expectation value from the restricted Bolson machine. 
and you know it it shows a discrepancy and that's discrepancy is kind of the interesting thing so we didn't have a discrepancy in this diagonal case but there is a discrepancy and that really is feedback back to the experimentalists to say you know your uh you know whatever you're doing in the experiment isn't exactly what you think you're doing based on kind of the naive measurements but this can go further so we can do all sorts of things and again maybe i'll gloss over the details here um but you know the when you have a model of the wave function in one of these generative models it's very powerful one thing we can get out of it is the entanglement entropy again something that's not accessible directly from the experimental measurements but if you have a model of the wave function uh, then you can form and i've done it here so you can form a sort a reduced density matrix and uh, this is my two-line proof of the second Rennie entropy uh, algorithm we use so if you know Penrose notation fine if not ignore this um, Henrik I got I just I got a notification you have a question sweet yeah uh, just a question what would happen because the samples before you generate new samples you could just take the samples that they took in the experiment right yep and I mean you could just take the of the, the matrix element of this of the X between those yep. right what would you get which curve would you get for the off diagonal oh if you did it here uh so i don't have that so what happens is that if you if you do that with the experimental data past i think it's eight sites in this case then it, it gives the wrong answer because it's not generalizing well sorry i i, I have a figure for that but i just didn't put it in this plot in this talk so so it gives something general, close to the, the generalization RBM. issue okay i see I see. So, right. So the experiment, so the data from the experiment would lie closer to the RBM curve than the ED curve. Um, yeah. Um, it, it, the closer, the, it, yeah, I, I actually don't have that data. I, I have other data of, um, of a different off angle matrix element. So I, I can't a answer that directly. Um, but I don't know which one it lies closer to, but I know it's off from, uh, the exact value that you would expect. And again, that has to do with the number of measurements. Okay. So if you only have 3000 projective measurements, what, what you're doing is you're losing your ability to generalize, um, uh, you know, which, which, you know, which means that like, that's not enough to reconstruct the off the angle observables. But yeah, I mean, a good point. I should put that in, in this talk. And once you get past, you know, I really think it's like eight to 10 Rydberg atoms. And if you're sticking, you know, if you're only doing three to maybe 10,000 measurements, the, you're really losing this ability to generalize. And, and yeah, I, I forget exactly how it manifests here, but uh, it's definitely, you can see it. I see. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. So again, this is all about generalization or generalizability or whatever the word is and limited and expensive data. Right. So on this, this is the same thing. I mean, this is just a more complicated, okay, I'm not going to go through this. But what we do is, you know, typically we replicate uh, the wave function. So here's a replicated bra and a replicated ket where you perform some swap operator, which turns out to be a trace of the reduced density matrix squared. That gives you a second Rennie entropy. And there, here's the second Rennie entropy, again, reconstructed from the restricted Bolson machine and, you know, compared to the exact diagonalization. But we have no way, you know, we have no direct access to this um, with the experiment. And so this is, again, just for the Kinnitz Matter people, I think one thing that's interesting, and I hope, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to do this, is when the experiments can tune into these interesting regions for the Z2 spin liquid, we get these measurements out, we train these models, we get these second Rennie entropies. I mean, you know, we're talking about hopefully experiments that are in the regime of, of 400 to 500 atoms. I know, I know Misha Lukin has at least a 20 by 20 array. And so that should be big enough to do uh, all sorts of complicated entanglement geometries. And again, this would be difficult to do experimentally. You can, I mean, it's been demonstrated that you can replicate the experiment to get this estimator out. Rajbal Islam did that, but I think he only demonstrated it for maybe four or six atoms. But here it's clear to me that we can do this for hundreds of atoms. So we can really extract something like the topological entanglement entropy um, uh, from, the, from this data. But okay, that's, that's kind of a... Again, that's, that's for the experts. Um, just a couple slides on, you know, more quantumness. Uh, you know, if, if you don't have this nice feature of the Rydberg Hamiltonian where it's stochastic, 
and then you have to worry about the phase, you're still okay in principle. You can parameterize both uh, the amplitude and the phase uh, through different sets of parameters. So here's my visible layer now. Uh, here's an amplitude. Here's a phase. That's fine. There's lots of different interesting ways to do that. But what you need, you know, fundamentally is data that comes in in different bases. And that isn't all that easy with the rig setups, but something like a trapped ion setup can do that. So we actually do this more with trapped ion uh, people, um, which I have data for, but it's not, you know, I don't think it's that interesting for this talk. And just one note is that, you know, you have to define a loss landscape. And so you can define a maximum likelihood loss landscape uh, for every basis. So here's, n qubits, here's x, x, z, 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 x, x, z. You know, each one of these is a different basis. You have some number of bases and you essentially add up the loss, lands, uh, loss function or the KL divergence for every one of those bases where the unitary that rotates you or the computational um, basis goes in there. So that's how you do it, it, it and it works. Um, if you want a density matrix, here's another visible. Here's, uh, here's like a physical, um, amplitude and phase and then an ancillary amplitude and phase that's a purification so you know you can take the same thing and just purify it you get a density matrix but i think at that point there's better ways of doing density matrices um so for example uh juan carasquilla especially uh has some really nice uh, povm uh based density matrix um reconstruction methods uh that you know can use any generative model uh there's a generative model stage that's this all the entanglements in some sense is captured in the generative model and then you have non-interacting uh povm uh, you know if you will operators or matrices here and that's a really nice uh way of, of breaking up a density matrix uh the povms are these operators and we we use all sorts of different generative models like an rnn works really well there um or you know even a, even these non um, explicit VAEs, GANs, and transformers. So this is where the field is going. I really think it's density matrix reconstruction, uh, sort of using all using generative models as one step, and then you know some sort of less naive parameterization of mixing and signs um, than I've illustrated here. And just to illustrate how that works, like if you do time evolution of of any of this, uh, uh, you know any of this data. Uh, then you need to have complex phases at least. And so here's that, here's a Rydberg Hamiltonian starting in the Z2 up, down, up, down, anti-ferromagnetic quenched um, uh, and time evolving. And each one of these dots is a reconstruction um, of, the, of the time evolution with a generative model, okay? And, and that in, in that case, this is synthetic. So we actually produce the data with other types of simulations, just to do proof of principle, this doesn't come from experiment because we need these other basis measurements. And actually there's two N, well, two N plus one different bases went into reconstructing this. And here's, the, here's sort of the evolution of the entanglement entropy, right, uh, as, you, as you time evolve the system. So this is what's possible. Uh, and you know, we're, we're ahead of the experimental data, but barely, let me put it that way. So just to summarize, uh, again, general models, I think they're, you know, they're, they're very suitable uh, to reconstruct uh, quantum states given data. Uh, you know, limited amounts of data are fine as long as uh, you have a good, you know, if you will, generative model. And really what you're, what you're aiming for is good generalization. Um, and again, for us, this is very different than uh, looking at Hamiltonians. You know, the Hamiltonians in the black box or, you know, the Hamiltonian uh, is used to prepare the ground state or whatever the state is that you're looking for. And in some sense, you're kind of doing tomography on what's in that black box. And I really think, as I showed, um, we've done proof, proof of principles with experimental data, uh, you know, but you know, I, I really think when we get more bigger simulators that have more access to different bases, uh, these generative models are going to be, I mean, my prediction is you're going to see them in every experiment. I, I really think they're a powerful tool. And fundamentally, I mean, I'm a theorist. Uh, I think it's interesting when you look at this, you know, reconstruction from data versus solving a Hamiltonian to ask, you know, these, these first two slides that I asked the question about like, what makes a problem hard? I think you can ask those questions here. And, you know, are the problems that we consider hard when we're solving the Hamiltonian the same as the problems that we will encounter when we try to reconstruct from data? 
So is it as hard to, re to, to reconstruct a ground state wave function from data as it is to solve a Hamiltonian? Let me put it that way. And I think it's interesting because the loss landscapes are very different. If you have a, you can have the same parameterization of a wave function uh, and you can try to try to optimize that with the variational energy and that gives you one loss landscape or you know you can have data coming in from this black box and look at the maximum likelihood or the kl divergence and that gives you a different loss landscape so you know in some cases we believe that these loss landscapes are glassy or non-ergodic is that true you know in the complementary case and i think that's a really kind of interesting theoretical question uh, going on look at that it's 11 o'clock exactly I'm going to say that was a success of timing. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your attention. And hopefully we have some time for questions. Wonderful. Well, thank you for this great talk. <laughs> very, very systematic, very enthusiastic. OK, questions? Anybody have a question? Uh, yeah, is there any concern that the uh, generative model has the same issue that you're sort of trying to avoid, that it's operating at like a lower complexity than the Hamiltonian that you're trying to model, and that the transformers or whatever generative technique can't go to whatever dimensionality you need? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the, like the RNNs, uh, you know, if, if you think of everything we've learned from DMRG, um, you know, really our one dimensional sequence map, you know, sequence to sequence mapping in some sense. And so you can really ask the question of, are the correlations, you know, so if you have a, you know, if you have a two dimensional system, like I was talking about for a while there, you know, isn't RNN sufficiently powerful enough in a representational sense to capture those correlations or that entanglement in the two-dimensional Hamiltonian? And that's a real concern. And so that's one reason why we go to the transformers, because the transformers have this attention mechanism. And that attention mechanism isn't a one-dimensional sequence, right? So theoretically, we, this is what we do. We essentially study these um, generative models with synthetic data, which I didn't really show, but we, we, you know, we bombard them with data from all sorts of one, two, three dimensional, whatever wave functions. And we try to try to figure out how exactly the correlations are manifest and represented inside there. Thanks, Neil. Uh, thanks, Roger. Uh, can you hear me? I can. Um, you mentioned the RBM and then you mentioned the recurrent uh, network. Right. And you, you said that, um, you had the, the loss of efficiency with the RBM because of the correlation time? Right. Is there any advantage of the RBM? Um, I mean, I love the RBM, so I'm trying to think what's not the advantage of the... So in some sense, the, the RBM is a very simple... Um, can you see the RBM here? Yeah. Yeah, so the, I mean, the RBM, is, the RBM is very simple to interpret, and also it's fully connected. And so... There's a bit of debate about this, but it's almost re related to Neil's question. Uh, but if you have full connectivity between visible and hidden, so in, in some sense, these things can represent any, any, rep any entanglement you know, or any correlation regardless of dimension or anything like that. So if you have some sort of long range um, correlation between you know, the, phys the most physically distant qubits, that's easy to mediate through two weights, for example, okay? And so I, I have a lot of work on the weight structure, interpreting how these weights look after training and, and relating that to correlations. So I think there's like an interpretability aspect of this too. When you look at the RNN, again, this is really a one dimensional sequence here. And so if you have correlations between the farthest distant spins or qubits or whatever, you better hope that the mechanism inside here, which isn't all that, you know, it's kind of opaque, you, you better hope that that's uh, a strong enough, uh, you know, it, the, the representational capacity is strong enough to um, uh, capture that correlation. And it's much harder to interpret. So it's much harder to interpret than just seeing a large weight in an RBM. So there's pros and cons. You know, I think if you increase performance, uh, maybe it's not universally true, but in many cases, you kind of lose things like interpretability. Um, but yeah, maybe that's, maybe that's too general a statement, but so there, there's definitely advantages to the RBM. But if you're looking for pure performance, I think, I think we just see better performance with the RNNs, to be honest. All right, thanks. And yeah, maybe a, a quick fo follow-up on that, also related to Neil's question and Hendrik's question before. So 
you, you spoke about having very general models that are you know expressive enough to capture all the possible uh, entanglements and so forth is there any value in this game in this game to actually restrict the class of models that you're using like if you know if you know something about the hamiltonian that's governing the system that you're looking at is there any value in encoding part of the knowledge into the class of the model that you're using to study the the state yeah so we do that already um in some sense when we let me try to find a slide here so you're totally right yes and and we do that in this case um here um, already when we throw away a whole bunch of like if you think about it at the end of the talk i talked about all sorts of extensions of what we do but if you really you have make no assumptions on your state. You should assume that it's a mixed state density matrix, but we strip all that away, right? Because we're making a whole bunch of assumptions and we boil it down to this. So that's kind of one uh, example um, of where assumptions come in. And that's what makes us different than quantum state tomography, where I think they try to have as little assumptions as possible. It's also, here's another example. So here's an RBM. I didn't have time to show this, but here, here we have some notion of locality and, but you see, there's a whole bunch of weights and biases, but you know, really you can prune a lot of those weights away. So, you know, here's, here's, here's uh, RBM after training. And then I don't know if any of you look at these lottery ticket hypotheses or these pruning papers, but you can actually prune a whole bunch of those things away and you see locality emerge in the RBM. So why not assume that locality to begin with? Right. And that would be another, you know, another assumption that you could bake into these models to get a bunch of performance but on that note actually you know over parameterization sometimes helps exploration of the loss landscape so it's not immediately obvious you know this is very heuristic you really want to get good performance and you want to reduce the number of parameters but sometimes sometimes it helps to have a few extra parameters so this is a this is a tricky question <laughs> i see thanks okay will you have a question all right um it, it was on like pitfalls for training these generative models. I've always found in the past that generative models can be somewhat of a black art. Do you, do you have any uh, common problems that you found while training these that, so that we can avoid them possibly? I am a wizard of, of training these things, or rather my students <laughs> are. So, I mean, there are, there are a lot of heuristics in this, absolutely. Um, and you know, the last one I mentioned with the pruning, uh, this is a really good example. So we spent years training fully connected RBMs like this. And only recently, again, this is unpublished, did we realize that, you know, you can prune, let me, uh, let me actually just go through this real quick. You can take, you can look at your weights of your RBM and here's ordered weights here. And this is a log scale. So this is the largest weight. This is a criticalizing model. It doesn't matter. And you can see there's some decay of the amount of weights that occur in an RBM. And if I want to get a certain energy or fidelity or accuracy, you know, typically I have to keep increasing the weights, and increasing the weights. But we looked at these papers um, on the lottery ticket hypothesis and pruning and so on, and realized that we should be able to chop off a bunch of these weights. But when you do, the performance gets worse. But what do you do? You start from the original model, you look at a threshold, you chop a bunch of the weights, and then you run it more. You have more iterations of the, of the, um, uh, in the more epochs of training, and then you'll actually get a better energy with less weights. I mean, that is a pure heuristic that really comes from like the generative modeling literature. And uh, again, there's no kind of theoretical guidance for this necessarily um, that I've found, uh, but it's definitely something that helps us out. So my answer to you is like, yeah, no, we're we're deep in the black arts here. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks indeed. Any more questions? Well, yeah, it doesn't sound I like a, it. I can ask a physics ah, question then. Go ahead. Um, hey, Paul. Yeah, hey, Roger. Um, physics question. Um, so, one of the reasons people got all excited about these Rydberg atoms was not due to ground state stuff, due to excited state stuff. This whole story that goes by quantum scars is one theoretical explanation for what's going on. Um, uh, your RVMs can say anything interesting about that? Yeah, I mean, you can train. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I lost my slide here. 
so you you can do dynamical reconstructions with this stuff right and so i mean in some sense that's kind of what i was trying to get get to here but you know every single one of these data points uh you know this is time evolution is a different rbm so you know it's if you want to train an rbm to maybe learn about the spectrum or something like that and with one set of weights it's kind of not how i know how to do it if you want to learn about a different if you want to learn about an excited state or you want to learn an excited state you have to take data from that and probably train separately a different set of parameters so I've, I, I, I don't yeah that's the whole point is you don't really know you know in the experiment what the excited states are you just see these revivals this this, this oscillating that you do but then somehow the explanation of the well the proposed explanation which is pretty believable is that this has something to do with very special excited states and uh, you know but there's no good way of getting at that and uh well in any yeah, it's, way, really it's not clear to me i mean I th you know i think i think what's i think what happens is you you'll reconstruct whatever you have data for but interpreting that like even interpreting you know, if you have the ground state and imagine you want to know the elementary excitations out of it, I don't see immediately how you would do that with this type of generative modeling. You know, if you have data for the ground state, the thing that you reconstruct is the ground state. That's it. If you have data for an excited state yeah. or a time evolved yeah, state. Yeah, but that's the point. It's this time evolution. It's not, it's not right. any, you know, it's some ensemble. Okay. So that's still a, so it's a, it's a that's still question, a... I think. And mm -hmm. I think, it, you know, without interpretability, like unless you can interpret the weights and, 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 you know, you might be able to, like if I could really interpret the weights of an RBM, let me just show that again um, here. So if I could really interpret these weights and again, so maybe you get something like this, it looks like a big mess, but then again, if I can get something like this where I say, well, okay, each one of these hidden units uh, mediates a bond or two, and I can understand how the lattice emerges and all that, then maybe you have a chance of doing what you want to do. Um, but I think without like that type of interpretability, you're, you're totally stuck. And let me, let me just say that these things are not easily interpretable. You know, typically you get something that looks like this, you know, and, and I mean, you could argue just to get into the weeds that you have a Hubbard Stratonovitz transformation here, you've decoupled, um, you know, the, the interacting degrees of freedom and coupled them to these auxiliary fields. But that coupling is insane. I mean, it's nothing that you can, back out a sort of workable, um, you know, Hubbard Stratonovich type model from. So, and, and so this is it. Can you, can we interpret machine learning? It's, it, can we explain, you know, is it explainable? Can we get explainable or explainability? And if we can't, well, we're screwed, but maybe that's the point with many body systems. Maybe certain things aren't interpretable. <laughs> Great way to end. Uh, <laughs> thanks. Thanks. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Great, great time. So if there's if there's no more questions, let me just thank you very much, Roger, for this fantastic talk and for the lively discussion afterwards. Thanks a lot to everybody who's asked questions. And I think it's a bit too early to wish everybody Merry Christmas, but since that's the last seminar of this year, let me just wish you a nice end of the year and let me hope that some of you will join again next year. That's it. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Philip. <laughs>